you got a front row seat over here. Okay, so the question we're gonna figure out today is what we can do, or can we do anything, actually, is a better answer, a better question, to expedite the arrival of the Mashiach. Can you close the door, please, Aviva? People have this habit of coming to ex-students or coming to the door and waving at me during class. Have you seen that before? It was like randomly come to the lab. Okay. There is a very unusual statement in the Gemara describing Mashiach. We have to understand this statement. And the statement is found on the top page 64 is the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Now remember, Sanhedrin is where many of the Gemarot about Mashiach are found. And we said possibly because the Sanhedrin is going to have to be reestablished in order to bring us Mashiach. Look at this unusual Gemara. And let's see if we can try to figure out. And then we'll look at a story about a man who met the Mashiach. Wow. Isn't that crazy? There's a Gemara that tells us about a man who met the Mashiach. Not the fake Mashiach, like the real Mashiach. Let's start with the Gemara. And let's try to understand this Gemara. The son of David, meaning Mashiach, because he has to be the son of King David, is not going to come out of the door, except in a generation, Shekulo Zakai or Kul That is either a completely righteous generation or one that is completely wicked. What a strange Gemara. It's going to be a generation. It is either really, really, really good or really, really, really bad. Just for interest, can you just look up for a second from your whatever you're doing? Why do you think it should be that way? I'm going to just be, yeah, pretty much average. Seeming like two extremes, either really, really good people or fully, really bad people. What's up with that? Let's think of an answer. Then we'll look at the Gemara, and then there's going to be a, a rough Gessler. We're going to give, he's going to give his answer to this question as well. I'll tell you what Rav is after. Any thoughts though? Any ideas from everything we discussed so far? Why this should be there? I think we said a different class that if the generation goes to Shiva, then Mashiach, like if everybody has the uplifted themselves, then Mashiach will... Okay, so completely righteous mean we have a, a generation of Fully righteous. Is, is such a thing even possible? Everyone's righteous? Even that's hard to understand, right? Yeah. But why would it have to be completely righteous, completely not righteous? What's... So Teshuvah's going to be able to do it, but why the really bad? And why these two? Yeah. Because it's like a time that you would least expect it, which shows... Why would it being a very, very bad generation or very, very good one? Think there's no hope. Like a mobile generation really bad. Because you, you know? would think there's no hope since we have to do teshuva and it's so wicked that, okay, Mashiach can't come, but then Mashiach comes and then everyone's like, oh. Wow, yeah. he's here. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, Viva. Or maybe it's like, if it's completely wicked, it's like beyond repair and it's like you need receiving. In Lanu Lishen Ella Al Avinish Bashamayim, says the Mishnah, things can get so bad, so bad, that God has to bring Mashiach because if he doesn't, it's all over. By the way, where do we see such a thing? Anyone know in history? Mitzrayim. Right? Mitzrayim got really bad. So bad, by the way, that the Haggadah tells us that had, did God not come in himself? Aniva lo malach, me and not angel, aniva lo shiliach, aniva lo saraf, me and not a messenger, me and not a fiery angel, whatever that is. Hashem himself had to go in. By the way, the Arizal said, because Egypt was so bad that even the Malachim would have been negatively impacted by it, which I don't understand, but that's what the Arizal says. So Hashem himself had to go in and take us boop, out of Misraim. But Hashem, had he not come out that year, in the Jewish year 2448, we would never go out at all. That's what it says in Haggadah, right? Because we were about to be completely assimilated and swallowed up into Egyptian society. So maybe... Aviva is saying very, very well that it gets so bad that we have no hope, and if it doesn't happen then, it ain't ever going to happen at all. And we guarantee. So why the really good? Well, just like you mentioned a moment ago, the really good is because we merit it. So these are the two aspects to this idea. 
either way, either way, it's kind of like in our hands. Now, of the two, you obviously want the good one, not the bad one, right? Because we even said the way that, and this is based on the prophets, the way that Hashem, this is the previous Gemara we looked at, based on the book of Zechariah. Zechariah sees him coming lowly on a donkey, right? The book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9, which is not very good. Maybe that's the bad version. We don't really work, earn it. It's like really, really bad, but Hashem's like, what am I going to do? I, got a, I promised the Avot, and I promised them they're going to get right. Moshe Rabbeinu, right? So I, I have to redeem them, but they don't really deserve it, but I have to do it anyway. That'll be the non-miraculous one. And the better version, obviously, is uh, like the book of Daniel, where everything is fantastic and hunky-dory, as we say. Let's have a look at the Gemara soon after this, where it tells the following unusual story that we have to understand. And the story is about Rabbi Yoshua, and he's walking through the marketplace, and he sees Elio Navi, Elijah the prophet, who at this point is dead. So what he saw, we don't know, but he manages to have a conversation with Elijah the prophet. That's pretty good, right? Anyone here meet Elijah the prophet? Anyone here? Anyone meet Elio Navi? Maybe you have, how do you know? How do you know that you have? Maybe Elio Navi is right here now, disguised as... I don't know. Doesn't tell us. But he seems to know straight away. Maybe he had a t-shirt saying, I am Elijah the prophet. I don't know. Maybe his jacket. I don't know. But he did know. So he sees him. And what question would you ask Elijah the prophet? I'd be like, crypto up or down? I'd be like, but that's just me. Because I got bills up the wazoo. But I think that's why I'm not Rabbi Ali. Yeah, you're sure. Rabbi Yeshua said... Amalei, look at the beautiful, let's go through the Hebrew here, because there's some, Zil, Shailalidine, Hechayetiv, he says, when is Mashiach going to come? I'm oh, sorry, Amas Ati Mashiach, when's Mashiach coming? All right, and he said, Amalei, Elijah probably responded to him, Zil, Shailalidine, go ask him yourself. Imagine that. When's Mashiach coming? What are you asking me for? Go ask him yourself. So Yeshua was like, uh, where is he? <laughs> You gotta tell where he lives. He says, de Rome. He is sitting at the gates of Rome. Okay. So he says, Well, I'm sure as many people sit at the gates of Rome. Well, my simana, what siman? How would I know it's him? And he said, Yashiv, he's sitting. Beine Anye, he's sitting among poor people. Sov And these are lepers, he's sitting. And all of everyone are taking their bandages off. These lepers are putting bandages on, winding them, unwinding them, okay? And putting new bandages on. And Mashiach is doing that. By the way, it's interesting. Mashiach over here is represented as a leper, as someone with Sarat. We'll have to come back to that, why he's depicted in this story as someone with Sarat. But we'll leave that. He's doing it, but he's doing it one at a time. He's not taking off all his bandages. Why? Because perhaps, perhaps, there'll be a moment when he's going to be needed and he doesn't want to delay. Okay, so you're going to recognize him sitting there in the gates of Rome, surrounded by lepers. They're all taking the bandages off completely. He's doing the one at a time. Okay, this is very, very unusual. So Yeshua went to find him. And there he saw the Mashiach, the Messiah, and said, Shabbalacha Rabbi Mayuri. Welcome, peace upon you, my master, my teacher. Amal Shabbalacha Bar Levi. He says, son of Levi. Shalom to you as well. He's Yeshua ben Levi, right? So he referred to him by his father's name, which we'll see in a second has some relevance. Amalei, le'e masati mar. When are you coming? Great question, right? Amalei, Hayom! Today! I am coming today. Wow. It's exciting, right? You're sure Levi must have freaked out. So he left. He had the information he wanted. Ata Legabi Eliyahu. He went to Eliyahu. Amalei, Ma'amalach. And Eliyahu said to him, Well, what did he say to you? And he said, Amalei, he said, Shomalecha Bar Levai. He said, He welcomed me and he, met, he, and he referred to me by my father's name. 
Ben Levi. Amale, that's a good thing, says Elo Lavi. Avticha lacha velavicha la'alma dati. That means you and your father are going to Olam Haba. Because he greeted you, and he greeted you in the name of your father. That means he kind of put you together. That's a good thing. And he greeted you, which means he's going to see you in Olam Haba. That's good. Amale, your Yeshua said back to him, ready for this? Only a Jew can act like Shikuri ka shekerbi. He's a liar. He lied to me. Wow. Isn't that crazy? That's what Gemara says. Yeshua called Mashiach a liar. Poof. I wouldn't do that. Damali hayom atina. He said to me, I am coming today. Velo but he didn't come. Amale. You misunderstood. You misunderstood what he was saying. When he said he's coming today, Hayom, he didn't mean today, he meant on the day. Because there is a verse in Tehillim which says, Hayom im bekolotishmol. Today, if you listen to my voice, Hayom im bekolotishmol. Today, if you listen to my voice. So the Hayom you thought meant today. It could have meant that. But actually what it meant was any day is open to the arrival of Mashiach if you do and say the right things. Hayom im bakolo tishma'u. That's the Hayom. You misunderstood the wording. We see from this, says the Gemara in a couple of places and many Midrashim, that the ability to bring Mashiach and end this final galut is biyadeinu in our hands. And we're going to go through certain specific mitzvot, specific mitzvot that we can do in order to expedite the arrival of the Mashiach. First one everyone knows is how many Shabbats do you have to keep in order to bring Mashiach? One. What did you say? Two. Well, which one is this? One or two? <laughs> you just switched positions. You're not helping. Uh, you're both right, by the way. Uh, the Gemara says two consecutive Shabbats, I remember. And the Midrash says one. I've heard, I didn't read this inside, that the possible um, compromise is one just could be a fluke, but two could be a sign that people really are keeping it. By the way, is it even possible every Jew keeps Shabbat? Is that even possible? It's like a theoretical formula. How could that even be? And what is it about Shabbat? So we're going to be looking a little bit later on about why Shabbat has the power to bring Mashiach more than any other day. Okay? We're going to be doing that. When it comes to preparing for Olam Haba. Okay, but Shabbat seems to be one of them. Another thing that we know about, for example, is with the arrival of Mashiach comes the third and final Beit HaMikdash. So we say, well, if that's true, then we can figure out exactly how to build the third temple. We just figure out what destroyed the second and first temple, right? It's just a logic. What destroyed the first temple? What destroyed the first temple? The three cardinal sins. What are they? Abode Zarah, Gileorayot, sexual immorality, and Shvichot Dami murder. Those are the three sins that led to the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. What led to the destruction of the second Beit HaMikdash? Sinat Chinam. So we learn from that Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred is the same as those three. Ah, oh, says the Sfar Simon, this is written in many, many places. Kevanch Ali de Sinat Chinam Necharav. Since the second temple was destroyed through Sinat Chinam, Koshkin Shali de Ahavad Yisrael, loving each other, Yenivne Bezrat Hashem. Then obviously, Bein Adam Lachaveru Mitzvot, that show Ava one to the other, is going to allow us to build the third temple. That's the logic that comes with it. 
This is hinted at in the Pesach Haggadah. The Chassam Sofa says, you'll notice something very interesting. Yeah? He says, if you would ask, what do we gain by being free from Egypt? We're back in Galut. He says, there's a difference. When we were slaves in Egypt, we didn't have the capability to expedite our redemption. We were stuck. The clock had to tick out. However, in this exile, we are able to. This is why at the beginning of the Pesach Seder, what do we say? Halach ma'anya. Whoever is hungry, come and eat. That hunger, by the way, could be a physical hunger, but also a spiritual hunger. We want to welcome people to our Pesach Seder tables who need to learn and understand, including our kids. Ah, that's why you end the Pesach Seder with L'shana Babi Rishalayim. That will lead to the ultimate redemption of Mashiach's arrival. So we know that Ava Yisrael, treating each other well, is going to be the panacea, the answer over here. Okay? The Chop, could you close the door again, Aviv? I'm so sorry. I apologize profusely. The Chavitz Chaim writes this in a number of places. I just picked out one piece for you on page 66. You know I'm not making it up. I would never make it up. I'm giving you all the sources yourselves. He quotes the Holy Zohar in Shemirat HaLashon. And he says, The many books write in the name of the Zohar. Right? That. You ready for this? This is unbelievable, by the way. This is probably the most unbelievable Torah you're going to learn today, if not the entire course. When we talk about Ahabat Yisrael expediting the redemption of the Jewish people, if you can close the door, please, thank you so much. If we talk about Ahabat Yisrael, we don't mean every Jew. You would have thought every Jew, right? Every Jew's got to keep your butt. Every's going to be natural. We all mean. He's like, forget that. Forget that. You know what? We mean, look at this, this is the Chavis Chaim in Shemerit Alashon, I'm not making it up. If only one community in the entire world, throughout history, Hayu Shomrim Midat Shalom was able to conquer the trait of Shalom, Yecholim Lezakot Lebeta Mashiach, Lebeta Mashiach. Can you imagine that? You don't need every Jew. You just need one community somewhere with real shalom in it. Mashiach would come. You know what that means, right? What does that mean? There isn't one single community in the entire world, for all of Jewish history, since the destruction of the Second Temple, that has real shalom inside it. Wow, that's sad, isn't it? Isn't that terrible? Right, they're arguing with the air conditioning, the rabbi's drasha was too long, I don't know the way he's looking at me, Mechitz is too tall, it's too short, it's too hot, it's too cold, we're paying the rabbi too much, too little, everyone's fetching and planing. I'm on the board of my synagogue, oh my god, wow, first time ever. I'm the assistant rabbi as well, and I'm, and I'm like, yeah, I just keep out of it. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not getting involved. But these people want the best. They probably, these people do want the best. But that's what he's saying. Im ken. If so, says the Chavaz based upon the Gemara we looked at, Biat HaMashiach Taluya Biadeinu is dependent upon us. It's in our hands. That's what he's saying. When, in other words, when is the Mishnah going to bring Mashiach? And the answer is, well, when are we going to do the right thing to bring Mashiach? Right? That's, that's like the obvious uh, follow-up question. Hashem's waiting for us. We're waiting for Hashem. Hashem's waiting for us. It's like waiting for God. Everyone's waiting for someone else. Shalom, that preserving peace we're not able to do and you're not gonna get you're not gonna get shalom in the community unless you work on not hating each other for no reason, baseless hatred, and Lashon Hara, which is obviously his big topic, of Chavaz Chaim, right? He, he, that's his whole thing. So he's actually like, what you say, and how you say it, is actually preventing Mashiach to come, or from coming. Lashon Hara, by the way, where do we see this in history? We should see this somewhere in history. Where's the famous example of Lashon Hara being spoken and preventing us from being redeemed? The spies, the miraglim, exactly. 
The spies came back with a bad report, right, about the land of Israel, and we weren't allowed in. We had spent 40 years in the Midbar. Hello? It's right there. Yeah? We are prevented from getting in. That's the problem. Yeah? That's why every person from working on this particular sin will have a portion of the future built temple. It's like amazing. Everyone's like, when's Mashiach coming? We come be like, do something about it. I don't want to do anything about it. I mean, I'm the same. Like, we want this like, free gift. The built on Hayabad, Harab Lilam. All right? Because without this temple, would remain destroyed forever. God forbid. So we're preventing our own arrival. Rav Desla adds to this and says, well, you know what? Let me explain. How it's even possible that we can marry Mashiach when our ancestors didn't. How come Mashiach didn't come from Avraham or from, I don't know, Moshe Rabbeinu's time or Esther's time or any of the great people? Are we as great as them? How can it be? So Rav Desla answers this question and he's going to do another question in a moment. And he says, what's the benefit of our exile? Right? Because we have a concept called Yuridot Hadorot. Or as he says, Hare had dorot, poltrim are getting worse and worse and worse. What merit do we have of bringing the Mashiach? It's a great question. How would you answer that? It's like if your ancestors were greater than us, we all know that. Right? Our ancestors were greater than us. Even our grandparents, we look at our grandparents, wow, that's a real Jew or Jewess, right? They were there praying, crying, suffering. But Mashiach didn't come for them. How's he going to come for us? Is that a fair question? How would you answer that question? Yeah, right. Well, if we're like the last influx of reincarnation of like souls in a sense, then can't you say that we've had the greatest suffering? Okay. I, I never thought of it through a, a mystical answer, by the way. But okay, if you want to go the reincarnation route, we've been here the longest. Okay. Could be. Could be. Okay. We have different challenges that our ancestors did. We're going to talk about that in a second. And therefore, what's expected of us, by the way, is really minuscule. Like, really minuscule. I like to, I have my friend, it's the Kotel answer, I call this. What's the Kotel? Kotel's like this, right? Everyone been to the Kotel tunnels? Yeah? You know what I'm talking about, right? And then it's like that, and then it's like that, and then it's like that. And you get to the top, yeah? And there's like a little rock, on that, little tiny rock on top like that, yeah? These are like 500 tons, about whatever, some crazy amount. This is our Avot. They're massive. This is Avram, Yizak, Yagav, Sara, Rivka, Revalet. This is them. And then you have next generation, not as great. And next generation, and then you get to the ones on top, and these are tiny little rocks on top. You can hold in one hand. Same wall. They can bring Mashiach because it's a cumulative effect. That's how they understand this. It's cumulative. It's not, we're coming on the backs of great people in history that allow us to merit it. So they can do it alone, and we can do it, but we're all part of one wall. I like that answer. I've never saw that inside. Well, I've heard similar ideas inside from the holy books, but it's true nonetheless. Rav Dest is gonna give an answer and say, Something pretty similar. He says, we know that generations have got worse progressively. Because the further away you are from Adam Rishon, right, which is the, like the photocopies, the first photocopy is good. The second photocopy, so there's Yurito Dorot is just the inevitable fall of humanity. The further away you are from Har Sinai, the less you are. Finally, the other, the secular world is the opposite. The further away from, you know, the apes of the gorillas, right? And I'm like, the better you are. We've progressed. And when I know we're actually regressing spiritually, maybe technologically, right? We are progressing. But spiritually, we're regressing. Yeah. 
So he says the truth is that the generations become distant from Torah, literally Har Sinai, which was the high point, the apex of Jewish history. Any involvement with Torah study and mitzvot is going to be better. Right? And he quotes a number of other sources, and Rav Chaim Vital, right? He says, we know the holiness of the Tani and Mizmar were astounding. And the generations that come afterwards are not that great. So he says, obviously, it's not going to take much. There's very little we have to achieve. Right? What they had to, you know, achieve in a lifetime, yeah, for us, we're not going to get that close. Right? They achieve things in moments that we can't. For us, it takes a lifetime to achieve things. So it's all commensurate. That the bar is set much lower for us. And that's what the Chobetz Chaim says. If you ask, what should we change? How can we prepare ourselves for the coming of Mashiach? What can we do to prepare ourselves for the coming of Mashiach? Page 67. He said, I would answer that God doesn't expect much from us. But this is the Chobetz Chaim speaking in the early 1900s. It's only got worse since then, right? It doesn't expect that much great accomplishments and things that are impossible for us to achieve. Rather, each person should strive to accomplish what is within their capability. Right? It's not quantity. It's our generation, because we are in the generation right before Mashiach. It's just a little bit of sincerity. Right? We cannot pray like, you know, the Gemara talks about Hasidic Roshoni would pray for nine hours a day and let out. We can't do that. There's too many distractions. We just don't, we're, we're the ADD generation, you know? In ADD? You know what it stands for? Attention Deficit Disorder. I disagree. I believe we're in the ADHD generation. What that stands for? Attention Deficit. Hey, donuts. <laughs> it's impossible. He's like, no problem. He says, what we have to do is less. What we do, just one minute of something that we do could be worth what it took years for previous generations. So it sounds weird, but maybe it's a benefit that we don't have this tremendous responsibility on our shoulders. That went with the Avot, and now we're just kind of like, you know, the last generation right before Mashiach comes. And he finishes off, al Cain, Achi Rai, my brothers and dear friends, prepare yourselves every way possible for coming in Mashiach. Each person has to strengthen the resolve to introspect, improve their actions for Hashem, that we can merit Karish Baruch Hu. Everyone according to their own capabilities. Yeah. Um, so did the Yetzirah get worse as time went on? Has the Yetzirah got stronger as time has gone on? Because like generations had different... I would say it's different. Challenges are different. Right? Our ancestors were dealing with where do I eat and how do I stop the Cossacks, right, or the jihadists from killing us, right? And, you know, how do I not starve to death or die of septicemia? You know what I'm saying? Our generation, the challenges are, for the most part, not of that sort. They're more spiritual and psychological. And I'll show you a Mishnah to prove that. Right? They are more psychological. So is that harder? I don't know. What's worse? Physical damage or mental damage? You tell me. What's a bigger challenge? A broken arm or a broken mind? I mean, or a broken heart? I don't know. That's... I mean, I do know, yeah. It's tough. Right? It's tough. Everyone has their own challenges. Has the nature of the Yetzirah changed? Yeah, I think it has. It, the Yetzirah will come in a form to attack us based upon where we are, what we're dealing with in that generation. Yeah. Yeah. Has got easy, I'll tell you that right now, sisters. And it's not that easy. Okay, so Rav Desla is now going to answer the following question. And that question is if we want to understand the question of the Gemara, why has to be a generation that's really, really bad or really, really good? So check this out. Now, Rav Desla, just so you know, some context, he lived before and after the war. He and his family managed to survive, I heard, separately. And then he moved to England, London, and he was in Gates, and then he moved to Eretz Yisrael, right? Um, so he's writing, and he took very Kabbalistic ideas and made them very easy to understand, especially things about Mashiach. 
So he wants to answer this question. What does this Gemara mean? Really, really bad, really good. Why would it be a, you know how we describe that? A generation of extremes. Would you say we're living in an extreme generation? Where there's like some really bad stuff out there and some really good stuff. Yeah? Our parents didn't deal with this. Our grandparents did. Everyone was pretty much the same. You know? One generation of extreme. I mean, they had to deal with extreme things, extreme poverty, extreme anti-Semitism. But on a society level, it was, you know. So he says like this. He says, it's very perplexing. Key. It's very difficult to understand. Why should a completely guilty generation have more of an ability to bring Mashiach than a generation which is a mixture of good and bad? Yeah, remember, Mashiach comes and things are really, really bad, really good, but not a mixture. It's like, we just say there's a mixture. So he answers in a very deep psychological way. Look at the answer to this question. Everyone understand the question, first of all, yeah? Great. He says, I'll do it in English. The idea is that as long as there is a mixture of good and bad people, yeah, people will use the good to hide the bad and masquerade as righteous when they're not. You see, if there's a good and bad generation, it's going to be hard to figure out who is good and who is bad. Right? Because, you know, everyone puts on pretenses. They all pretend they're something when they're not. And they could be that because we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors. We don't know what they're using for dinner. We don't know where they are all the time. Some into this generation, he says, in such a state a person is far from teshuva and also far from being ready for redemption. But in a generation that is completely guilty, kulo, chayav, when people are materialistic and inclined towards physicality, without a semblance of spirituality, where even the idea of believing in God is mocked. Right? It used to be that everyone was a god believer. You didn't believe in God. Like, oh, that's good. Oh, that's a nice way to spend your afternoons. Now you're a god believer, and, you know, they'll mock you. Right? Even the Jews will mock you. They're like, what? You're still doing the whole Jewish thing. Every show, every article, every newspaper, is always a Jew complaining why every other Jew... Right, right, right. You're why the Jews are still believing in God. You're so backwards, right? We're the backwards people. It wasn't that way. He says, with that, so in such a generation, right, in such an instance, he says, does one virtue shine forth simplicity? That when you see Emmet in a sea of grossness, it's going to stand out. So it needs. Let him finish, then I'll give you my thoughts. At such a point, it becomes impossible for people to cover up the evil within them with tricky stuff. To, you, you can't fool anyone else. We all know. It's all out there. It's all in the open. We live in a society where everything is on display. Without a notion of righteousness, there is simply no facade left for a person to trick himself with. Precisely at this point, a person close to Shuva, if he can sense that if God doesn't assist him, he's lost. Right? You're so far down the rabbit hole that only a Kodesh Baruch Hu can yank you out. As the saying goes, and this is a quote from the Mishnah that we're going to look at inside, Mashiach will come and we have no one to rely upon except our Father in Heaven. Right? That's the end of a Mishnah that describes the societal challenges we'll be having before Mashiach comes. Vakarazu this recognition, that's how you're going to bring Mashiach. What's going on? What's he saying over here? What is Rav Tesla saying in this poignant piece? What is he talking about? What is he saying? He's like, it can't be a mix of good and bad. Good and bad is not going to, it's not going to help you to, to the truth, the final recognition. What you need to be in a generation where people are really bad and some people are really good. Why? What's he saying? What did he say? Rav Desla is answering our question. Mashiach is more likely to come generation from the Gemara where everyone's very, very bad. Okay? Because simplicity stands out and like truth. 
or addicts like Abhishan will be politicized because there's like such polarization. Right. That is a good word to use, polarization. When society is so polarized, and we see, which we're seeing now, it's like it used to be everyone was pretty much the same. Now seeing this polarization, even among our own Jewish people, we're so far apart, it's going to be actually ha'emet yeneederet, says the Mishnah. Truth will be hidden. In, there'll be pockets of truth. It's going to be hard to distinguish between, because when everything's really, really bad, the truth signs. It's like a light in a dark room. He basically, Mashiach comes when you're in a dark room, right? Because one little bit of light, even one candle, makes that much of a difference. If there's a little bit of light in the room, you can't see the candle, right? Because the light's coming in from other sources. He's saying, we're going to live in a generation, which we are right now, by the way, where things are so bad and people are doing such gross things in public, which is something they used to hide. They used to hide stuff. Like, you didn't know what people were doing behind their doors. And now... People used to like, you know, write diaries that people couldn't read and, and now I just put up so everyone can read exactly what I'm doing all day, every day. From the food I have to relationships I'm in to, you know, it's all like, you're like, wow, that is so bad. Ah, now you're going to get a push to the shuva. That's going to be, because you look around and you're like, whoa, we are in big trouble. So he says, that's what the Gemara means. This is understanding. When it says the world's going to be so bad, that's all we're going to do is just completely fall apart. Society breaks down, and we have no to rely upon except Avinu Shabbat Yeah? Okay. Um, questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. When you say the world is going to be so bad, is it like the entire world or just world like for the Jewish people? Um... Well, we are affected by the world around us because we live throughout the entire world. So it's going to be the world in general, which we're seeing, and it's going to affect us badly. It's going to affect the... Notice, by the way, the Jewish people in Galut don't find themselves in the middle of nowhere. We're in the epicenter of world powers, whether it be the Greeks, right, the Roman times, or the Persian times, or German times. Right? Germany was the... Right? We're not like some random tribe found in the middle of nowhere being persecuted. We found ourselves right in the middle. Eretz Yisrael, boom! That's what everyone's talking about. America, boom! I mean, it's chicken and egg. What came first? All right? Did those countries become those countries because we were there? Or does Hashem allow them to prosper because we're there? You know what I'm saying? And that's, I mean, that's the chicken. I mean, that's the question. Which one comes first? Whichever one it is, we're still stuck. So what's ever happening in the general society is going to affect us. We're not immune. No one's immune, even those who, you know, lock themselves away. Right? It's like Noah. You walk into a tannery, you're going to smell of a borsiki, you're going to smell of it. Same thing. So we are being affected. And you didn't know that. I'm not saying that you don't know. Anyone here not being affected by the society around them? I don't want to hear. Yes, Ilana, what did they say? But didn't every generation have no one else to depend on besides Hashem? So. You're right, we always have to depend upon our Gosh Baruch Hu. What he's saying is, what the Gemara means is, it gets to a point where you lose hope in everyone. Don't in we... government, by the way, the breakdown of government we're going to see in the Mishnah is a major part of this. They're We've not going to be able to rely upon. for like so many generations already that you can't believe in anyone else. I hope so. Many people still believe in the government. They still think the government's going to save us. They still think the money's going to save them. Right? They still think their friendships and relationships are going to save them. Nope. Don't work. Been there, done that. Been there, done that. Before we get to that mission I want to talk about, um, which maybe next class we'll see, I want to just talk about a couple of the precursors to know we are close to Mishiach's arrival. Here are two, but there's many more we'll come to later on. The first one, which is absolutely fascinating, comes from King David himself in the book of Psalms. Chapter 147, verse 2. And these are words we say every single day in Shacharit. Bone Yerushalayim Hashem, Nidre Yisrael Yekanes. Page 69, as well follow. What do those words mean? God is the builder of Jerusalem, and the Jewish people are going to be gathered to it. Say the commentators, I've read for one, but many say this. 
You know what that means? Who are bone and God is going to build the city of Jerusalem. That is going to be the precursor to the arrival of the Jewish people into the land of Israel and the coming of Mashiach. Because it makes sense, right? I mean, why would it be? Why would it be that that's a prerequisite, but even a sign, Mashiach is close, that Jerusalem is being built up? Well, it's got to be his capital city. He's going to be the king of Israel. In his capital, he can't walk in. Israel's empty of Jews, and Jerusalem's a barren desert. It can't be. So a prerequisite to Mashiach's arrival, before you get in the pre-Messianic era, is that, says King David, you're going to see the city of Jerusalem built. Sound familiar? I mean, you know. Every time I go, I'm like, was that building here before? And by the way, in case you think it was always like that, 100 years ago, or even less, less, right? My mother was, was born in, 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 in Eretz Yisrael, and she said, you could just go to Jerusalem, you could go to the hotel, it was dangerous, right? My grandma moved there from the Middle East. So you couldn't, she lived in Jerusalem. It's like, you could just go to the coat. It was like, how many buildings? It was sniper's haven. Jordanians, Palestinians, right? The British, it wasn't so simple. All right? And now suddenly it's this far as you just turn around, but half a hole, it turned around. This is a siman, says King David, and the chef's arrival. Right? That's what it says here, yeah? That's number one. We're also going to be C, B and C, actually, great prosperity among the Jewish people financially before Mashiach comes. Says the Gemara, Umaru lomar Why in the Shimon Esrei does the bracha of the ingathering of the exiles come after the blessing of Birchat Hashanim, of Parnassah? You can see those two brachot are juxtaposed, which means put next to each other in the Amidah. Not a coincidence. Every bracha in the Amidah comes in a very specific order. Actually, the entire latter part of the Bakashot section, the middle section of the Amidah, is all about the coming of Mashiach, by the way. From building Yerushalayim, gathering the exiles, burning Yerushalayim, gathering the exiles. So why? I'll tell you why. Because first of all, we're going to see the land of Israel is going to bear a lot of fruit. And by the way, this is mentioned in the prophets, a number of prophets. We're going to see the land of Israel is going to produce a lot of fruit and be very, very financially successful. And then the Jews are going to gather there. Why? Because when we turn up, we're going to need something to eat. We're going to need jobs. We need Parnassah. So one of the signs Mashiach is close. Right, which is why I want to put it out there, is that the ingathering of the exiles is going to happen at a time where there's a lot of harvest in Israel. Right? Where the country is doing well, the startup nation is doing very, very well, so that it can support millions of Jewish people coming from all over the world, which we're seeing right, for the past you know, 60, 70 years. Now it's just gone hyper in such a short amount of time. This is miraculous. And it is mina shemayim. It's not just human involvement. We believe that Harish Baruch is behind it all. And it's actually preparation for the redemption of the people, of, 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 the, of Israel, the Jewish people, which start to... Inge- so in order to bring people, you need to have prosperity. Right? No one's going to go to live in the you know, middle of you know, Afghanistan right now. You go where the money is and the successes. So that's... Eretz Yisrael right now. That's what it says. Those are two good signs. There are, is also a final sign that we'll talk about. A final sign. And together with this one, we have to go a little bit deeper. Okay, so we have two signs so far. But I want to talk about a fifth one too. It says in the Pasuk, in Bereshit, Al penei kolachav nafal, Yishmael and the descendants of Yishmael are going to fall before all their brothers. And the next pasuk says, "Ve'ele toldo Yitzchak." These are the generations of Yitzchak. 
So one Pasuk says Yishma'al falls. The next Pasuk says that Yitzchak arises. Says the Baal Haturim. These two phrases are placed next to each other to teach that when Yishma'al, from whom the Arabs are descended, will fall at the end of days, then the son of David, Mashiach, who is descended from Yitzchak, is going to arise. There is this seesaw effect. Okay, so let's just finish today's class with the fifth day. The Arizal, as quoted by his student, Rav Chaim Vital, in his commentary to Tehillim, talks about a fifth and final exile. This is the final one. So we learn there's four exiles, right? Babel, Parasumadai, Yavan, Romi, a.k.a. Edom. Yeah, remember that? So he's like, yeah, that's what he learned as a kid. Let me tell you about a fifth exile, which is called the exile of Adam. Adam. Who is this exile? Who is this about? Who is called Adam, referred to as Adam in the Torah? Anybody know? Who is referred to as Adam in the Torah? Esau? Not as the opposite. It's referred to as an animal, a behemoth. He was hairy like one too. He was asui. No, 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 no. Who's referred to as a para Adam? A wild ass of a man. Yishmael. Now, he's called para Adam. Para Adam. Para means wild, unbridled, but he's still an Adam. The first four exiles. The Daniel, Prophet Daniel compares to various animals. For example, we know that Paras was a bear, right? And we know that the Adon was a, 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 an eagle. Various creatures. Right? Adam and Esau was also called a pig. Various creatures. But the Prophet Daniel refers to various creatures, right? Lions and leopards. And suddenly we get, oh, we have this thing called the Adam. That's Yishmael, is Adam. But he's peri, he's was unbridled. But he's still, that's pretty good, right? Adam. Why do we get this name? Why do we get this name, Adam? This is fascinating. Check this out, we'll finish with this. We did a lot today, I know. So check this out. The Bnei Yishmael have a schut. They have a merit. What do they do? One, they do Brit Mila. And two, he says, they pray. But he says, they're bad to us. They hurt us. They're blowing us up, attacking us. He says, at the end of days, you're going to see Shmuel's going to rise up. And it's going to seem like they're going to have complete control. And he says, that's why it's not a coincidence, he says. That what's on Harabai right now? Yeah. Al Quds and the mosque. He's like, Yishmal and Bnei Yishmal have the merit of Harabai. Imagine that. Unbelievable. Why? Because they are not commanded, but they do this. They pray very, very well. And they have real emunah, and they do Brit Milah. They are low mitzvahosa. They're not commanded and do. We are mitzvahosa. We are commanded with mitzvahosa. is better, right? Because we do it as Hashem says so. They volunteer. They get merit for that. They get harabite, but only an olam has uh, not in olam haba. Olam haba, which comes with Mashiach, we get it. So he says at the end of days, the Bnei Shema are going to hurt us, and they're going to attack us, and they're going to make us cry out in pain. But don't worry, Yish Ma El. 
God is going to listen. Yishmael, God is going to listen. He's going to listen to our prayers and he's going to answer our prayers. Can he hear us crying out from the actual pain? That's the name. Yishmael is a beautiful name, by the way. Beautiful name. I mean, we don't give Jews that name nowadays. There was a rubbish man on the Gemara. But it's a sign that Gosh Bob will listen to us in the days. And by the way, remember Yishmael did Teshuma at the end of his life. Right? He was involved in burying his father, Abraham Avinu. So to the Arabs, going to give us a lot of trouble and a lot of pain, he says. But they're Adam. And they get schut to being Adam. They're considered great. And they get, they get the merit of Hara by it. It's not a coincidence. Right? I mean, it makes no sense. I mean, when Moshe Dayan, and they took over Harabayat, remember the whole thing? Harabayat Adenu? They took the keys, and they gave it to the Waka and said, you can take over. It's the craziest thing that's ever been done in world history. It's complete madness. It's, got to, it's so crazy, it must have been a Shemayim. They, they can't get it to control it. They're like, yeah, you can take care of it. What's that? That's, I would say, this is me speaking, Gezerah Minish Shemayim. That's a Gezerah Minish Shemayim. It has to be. It has to be. Yeah? So that's, he says, that's the fifth and final exile, which he said is going to be short and very, very difficult. But when you see they start to go down, we're going to go up. So that tilt of power between us and them, which, by the way, is coming actually to a peaceful end right now in a lot of these countries, right? We're seeing it right now. Unbelievably, that's not a coincidence either, I believe. And we're seeing this happen right now. Thoughts? Comments? They're going to have Hara by Tom comes. They have it right now. They right. control you right now. It's unbelievable. It's like crazy, isn't it? Absolutely nuts. Wow. Predicted. Yeah. Very, very good. Very, very good. I don't know the answer to that question. There's a couple ways to look at it. When Yeshua went in to conquer the land, he had to uproot all Abu Zarah and wipe them all out. I don't know if that's necessarily true, because we know many non-Jewish people are going to come. We know. Prophet Isaiah tells us in the second chapter, they're going to come and flock to the land of Israel. Right? Are they going to have residence? I don't know the answer to that question, but there's going to be a lot of change of land ownership for sure. And we're seeing it right now. Right? It's hard to buy land anywhere in Eretz Yisrael. Definitely in the heart of Eretz Yisrael. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, it's become exorbitant. Yeah, but it doesn't mean there's not non-Jews that are still part of the land at that point. I don't know. Okay. I do not know. We'll find out. Thoughts, comments, questions? Okay. We'll stop it there so I can return you midterms.